Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new edition of the Behind the Curtain podcast on the Nittany Sports Now Network. My name is Jared Brewer, and I'm joined by my good friend, Murph. Murph, it's been a while since we spoke. Life gets in the way sometimes for the two of us being coast to coast. Um, you know, you're enjoying some heat, and we're not enjoying it up here. Uh, but for Penn State, they handled the L.A. heat and Hollywood lights with, I don't want to say ease, but they won the game and they escaped Hollywood with a victory and became one of just a few teams to cross cross time zones and escape with a win. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they went in there and obviously it was a tale of two halves as we've come to expect this year with this Penn State team. Um, notorious for so-so first half and then, you know, dialing it up in the second half. And and absolutely, the teams going to the West Coast or the East Coast across the three time zones were one and nine uh, going into this weekend. And now those records are now two and ten. Obviously, we know who got the win. And obviously, we know who got the loss. Um, but before we get into that and the review of that and, and moving ahead, guess what Penn State found? A kicker. The kicker. We have a freaking kicker. Ryan Barker had an incredible game, obviously. Walk on, which, it, it, and that's tough because, you know, to talk a little bit about Barker, he's he's a walk on, and as a coach, you want your you want your scholarship guy to 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 try to earn it, and and I think Barker has been the guy, and noticeably the guy, but because he wasn't a scholarship guy. He didn't get always maybe the, the most opportunities as Sanders Sahadik did, but he made the most of them against USC, and he was a big part and one of the biggest reasons why they won. You saw a great Drew Aller um, despite the three interceptions. You saw an okay running game. They sold out to stop the run. Plus, I think they were a little timid with, with Nicholas Singleton because of coming back off an injury or, or, or being out, I guess I should say. Nobody is ever going to clarify what was actually wrong with him. Um, and they had some good production out of receivers, especially Julian Fleming on fourth down, on the two fourth down conversions. And that's what you bring a guy in like Julian Fleming for. So, I mean, Penn State gets a good win. Um, it's weird to say that maybe against a team that is now with three losses, but it's okay to get good wins against teams that have two losses, even this early in the season when you played, when they played the type of schedule that, that USC has. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, USC is a, is a legacy program. We all know that it's part of the blue bloods. Um, of course they lost a lot last year when, when Caleb, Caleb Williams uh, moved to the NFL and, and Fleming, not Fleming, sorry, Lincoln Riley come in and, and it's taken his team. And, and I will say this, the, the biggest addition to that team right now, I would have to say is bringing in Penn state, ex Penn state, D-back, downtown lane. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely can tell a difference with this defense. Um, uh, last year, the defense was an absolute joke. They're not quite there yet, but um, it it was a big win. I, I, it definitely was a big win. And, you know, we, we will touch on this a little bit. And uh, as you know, Jared, I do uh, uh, 10 things, I think, I think uh, pretty much weekly after, after the Penn State game where I touch on 10 items from that game. And I opened up with, you know, it, you have to revel in the glory of a big PSU win on the road in the Big Ten. And I, you know, you know as well as I do as, as people that are, I don't want to consider myself in the media, but we do put media out there with the podcast and with the things that I put on my 10 things, I think. You're, you're going to have people, you know, with different opinions, and, and that's great. But the, the interesting in this case was the, how can you say this is a big win? There are three and three teams. And, you know, I, I look at that and I'm like, okay, you know, so on the surface, a three and three team, yeah, maybe don't, you maybe don't do it um, as a huge win. Like we didn't beat Ohio State, we didn't beat Michigan. But my response to that is this, and I'm going to read this verbatim as to what my response was to that. Um, USC lost to Michigan by three. They lost to Minnesota at the end of the game. And now they lost to Penn State on the last play of the game. It's big in the sense that in the past, Penn State normally ends up on the wrong side of these games. 
It's also because Penn State showed some maturity coming back in a game. Drew Aller, Julian Fleming coming up big, um, which we have not witnessed in the past. Um, so it was a huge win. It's a big win. It could be a, for them, hey, guys, we can do this. We can do this. I think that's a, it's an incredibly good point. You know, it, it, it's weird to say, again, like I said, you know, USC's record doesn't indicate that this is a, 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 a large magnitude win. This is not a tier one win. And I, and I rate a tier one win, and it's a top five win uh, against, you know, Ohio State or a Michigan, which Penn State still has the opportunity to do in just a few weeks. Um, but the biggest thing is they went into USC, were down big, and came back and, and stayed in it. Um, and that's a confidence booster. And we're going to talk a little bit about how do you finish with this momentum heading into a bye week um, in the second segment. But USC is big because USC at two losses is playing for their season. They come out scoring their first play of the game, uh, which was just a simple over pursuit, which Penn State gets in trouble for quite a bit. And again, guaranteed that's why that was the play call that they had. You know, over pursue. Guy runs forever, right? But it's a big win. It's not one of Penn State's biggest wins under James Franklin, but it is a big win. There are multiple games, even in the state of California, that have been bigger wins than than this one. But the biggest thing is that they were down. They showed an ability to come back. And this is a USC team that, that like you said, they lost by three to Michigan. They lost by seven to Minnesota late on a ballsy play call absolutely by PJ Fleck and they lost in overtime to number four Penn State so this team is you know potentially a player two or three away from being where Penn State is yes you know and, yeah. and, and that's tough to gauge um obviously the record doesn't indicate how good this USC team is and this is a nice little welcome to the Big Ten moment because uh, this isn't this isn't what was going on in the Pac-12. This wasn't Pac-12 after dark where they're blowing the doors off of UCLA or Cal or Stanford or whatever. It's a big boy football in the Big Ten. And they have sure. not played an easy schedule by any means. They played US or LSU to start the year, um, you know, then Utah State, whatever. Then they were right into Big Ten play, and that's not an easy thing to do. And fortunately for Penn State, this is a game that you kind of expected – James Frank for James Franklin, he goes in, they fall fall down early, and they don't come back. But this team did come back. Andy Kotelnicki in the offense, play calling, I thought was really good. I think they do try to get too cute with some things, but the trickeration worked. You know, Tyler Warren and, and his play center, um, the fourth down or the run that he took a direct snap uh, up under center. Um, I thought those were two marvelous play calls in those moments. And the biggest thing is, again, they found a way to come back and keep USC right where they wanted them the entire game. The two two interceptions that, um, that Drew Aller threw didn't overly hurt them. They held them to six points off those turnovers. And that's the mark of a really, really good football team. Yeah, and, and, and Jenna, to touch on those interceptions, the – the second one, especially, was just a, a very bad throw. I mean, they, they, he was. It looked like it looked like a a, a zone, but it, or a man. I'm sorry, a man cover too. And the defender was there, but there was also two other defenders right there in the vicinity. Uh, I mean, the guy tipped the ball. The guy made a great play on it, but it was a fact he was throwing into triple coverage. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, and and you touched on some things there, and we know it. Not only do we know it and have seen it coming, but Tyler Warren is now in the national discussion across the country. But as far as I don't want to say Heisman winner, obviously that's not going to happen. But he's in the discussion right now for votes and for a tight end. And now I know we've had Brock Bowers in the past, um, you know, with, with the, the things that he's done in the last two years before going to the NFL. But Buck Bowers doesn't do the things that Tyler Warren does as far as being a Swiss Army knife of things. I mean, he's he's snapping the ball. He's catching touchdown passes when he snaps the ball. He's lining up at quarterback, under center. He's lining up at H-back. He's lining up in the slot. He's lining up at tight end. He's lining up a wide receiver. He's lining up in the backfield. 
Like, and and it's effective. And one of the you mentioned the the, the center pass there, but the other play call that they did where Allard did a fake boot pitch or a fake pitch to the left, booted around, turned around and threw to the opposite side of the field with Moore, who ran for days. I mean, he mm -hmm. almost scored on that play. So right from the beginning, I, I'm thinking this is what Harrison Wallace and or, or Omari Evans had mentioned earlier here a few weeks ago. It's like, uh, you guys haven't really seen anything yet. And that was proven a lot in this game. And I agree. Uh, in the past, Penn State just has a tendency to lay an egg when they go across time zones. I mean, I, I'm looking at the Wisconsin game now, a 7.30 game. Um, people are like, oh, a 7.30 game at Camp Randall. Well, I'll tell you what. I would rather that game be at 7.30 than at noon when it's 11 o'clock in the morning there because we all know mm -hmm. that track record of Penn State. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the other thing too. You know, for me, I, I mentioned this on the on my Lashing Out podcast and and a lot of thing. And I think on our post game hit right after right after uh, the last game, James. There's no coach, and there might be a coach that's pretty that's, that's prepared, but there's nobody that goes into the depths that James Franklin does to prepare to go over to for whatever game it might be. The planning. The every everything has just gone over with a fine tooth comb, and that's the level of attention to detail that makes Penn State a consistently good program. Those are the types of things that you don't get at at other uh, other schools because they don't necessarily care about the details. And the devil is in the details. Certainly, if you're any sort of coach, you coach the game. I've coached it. It's the details that add up. It's going the extra day early. Prepare yourself. It's not showing up the day before at four o'clock, then waking up and going to play a noon football game like UCLA did. I'm not saying that UCLA ever stood a chance in that game, but it's those little things that you might not think about that just go in and they're like, okay, well, this makes sense now. Um, but for Penn State, the biggest thing, again, it's okay to say that this is a big win. Right now, honestly, every win is, is a big win. It doesn't matter – what the record of the team is because guess what? The SEC is self-destructing um, and in a big way uh, because of that. And this is what makes – I said this on, on our Lashing Out podcast. I love where college football is right now. Um, it is a beautiful brand of football because Chaos. every week – Right, every week matters. And yeah. that's what makes college football so awesome right now because any given Saturday or Friday night or whatever, strange things are happening. Alabama does not look like Alabama would, which is expected because it's Kalen Navarre, not Nick Saban, right? So it, it's – then you've got games like Oregon and OSU that come down to the wire and as an experienced quarterback doesn't know this – doesn't know the clock or or whatever. Or Ryan Day gets outcoached again in a big game, um, mm -hmm. you know, with Dan Lanning and the 12-man on the field that was just over – just changed – Rule change really quick. I haven't seen anything move that fast since the Kenny Pickett fake slide rule. But, you know, now they've got the rules changed for them. And, you know, Oregon now is in the driver's seat of their schedule. Um, but it's so fascinating because, again, people people say that this is the second biggest win for James Franklin, right? It, it's not. In my opinion, I personally believe that the biggest win that James Franklin had was that 2016 game against Minnesota, where they're fire Franklin at halftime. They come out, win the game in overtime, go on um, and, and play some really good football the rest of the way. And the rest, of, as they say, is history. But obviously, the Big Ten Championship's up there. The Rose Bowl win is up there. The Fiesta Bowl win, which you were um, the Fiesta Bowl win, I know, because we were there together uh, to an That's extent. Cool. Um, you know, and, and obviously 2016 OSU is up there because of the flukiness of the win, but by no means is this one of the biggest wins of his career. It's still a big win though. And it's okay to admit that this is a big win despite maybe USC not having the right amount of wins or losses. So, um, I, I think you have to go beyond the, the purview of what you see immediately in front of you if you're going to challenge us to, quote, not be a big win. Um, you can't go by what the record is because if USC wins this game, if USC 
uh, doesn't lose on that fluke ballsy touchdown call. I mean, we, we're all about ifs. You know, you look back at Penn State and, and, and Ohio State in 2018, uh, fourth and five. What if he doesn't right. miss that? He, if he doesn't miss that block on Ch if, mm -hmm. if he whistle on that block of Chase Young, or he makes that block on Chase Young, yeah, Miles Sanders had nothing but green in front of him. You know, you can sit yeah. there and play what if. So you have to look at the big picture and, and, and realize that, okay, if Penn State loses this game, what happens at Wisconsin in two weeks? What happens in Ohio State in three weeks? You know, from, from last week, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, to, to me, it's big in the essence that probably eight, nine times out of ten in the past, Jared, Penn State loses this game. Uh, yeah. So, so something something to build on here as as we move forward on, on the podcast with with that. Yeah. Speaking of building on, we're going to talk a little bit more about how they can continue this momentum when we come back for the second segment of the Behind the Curtain podcast on the Nittany Sports Now Network. Welcome back to the Behind the Curtain podcast on the Nittany Sports Now Network. He's Murph. I'm Jared. Now Penn State has won this game. They go right into the bye week with some momentum. It's not common throughout the rest of the big 10 but the biggest thing is continuing that momentum getting getting back to you know gameplay next week at camp randall is not going to be easy and you know that ohio state is looming one and no mentality teaches you that you know they're probably not thinking a lot about osu but they're certainly in the back of their minds but you got to get through Wisconsin. Camp Randall is not an easy place to play. You mentioned it in the first first segment. But for Penn State, right now the focus is the bye week and that development. The biggest thing is they haven't played a perfect game in all three facets of the game. You know, special mm -hmm. teams was superb on Saturday against USC. Defense did not start out well. Neither did the offense. But they find they found ways to get better throughout the course of the day. The offense, I thought, started to fire on all cylinders, really. They're late in that second quarter. Um, they, they went into the half with the momentum because they forced USC to kick a field goal, kept them right where they wanted them, knowing that they get the ball back after the half. The way that people don't understand how the strategic, strategic game is played, the mental game of football, those middle eight, so to speak, is is baffling to me because I mentioned this on our high school football broadcast all the time. Franklin mentions winning that middle eight all the time. And nine times out of 10, if you win that middle eight, you're going to win the football game. And they mm -hmm. came out and they won that middle eight. They hold them to a field goal there late score in their first possession. And then it, it's, they have the momentum. And, and then when you're able to go into the locker room, it's not an insurmountable lead or deficit or whatever. And then come out, score, do your thing. Then, Okay, it's time to play. Yeah, and so as you talk about building on the momentum, um, even within the game, uh, as we look back at the USC game last week, uh, that first possession of Penn State was an absolute masterclass of play calling, formations, mm -hmm. motion that Kodanecki has done all season. Like, it should have been a like, touchdown. Well, and that's where I'm going. So, you know, they come down, they score, they throw the flag for offensive pass interference. And when, when you see it from one angle, you're like, yeah, he did. But then when you look at the angle, which would have been like from the middle of the field, looking out towards that, Fleming comes straight off the line, does not extend his arms, does not extend his arms. He was trying to run. In fact, the defender was jamming him, and Fleming just kept moving forward. So, you know, if you're a receiver and you're trying to get out, well, what are you supposed to do now? So, um, and, and I'll touch on that. I got a, I got a curtain call uh, coming here today or tonight at the end. Um, but that right there, and then Penn State had to kick a field goal. And that took a lot of momentum away from Penn State on that call. You, you can see it happening. And then to make matters worse, on the very first play, we had the reverse, the fake double reverse, and – Gone, 75 yards. Like, so you say riding the momentum. You can ride that momentum within a game, and then you come back and you talk about the middle eight. Yes, absolutely. They held him to the field goal after the Alabama interception. 
held them to a field goal. Okay, great, guys, we're still in this. We're down by two touchdowns. Let's get to work. They come out, they score there at the beginning, and then, you know, it, they rode that momentum. So now that that's over and done with, you, you, you are taking the momentum. The momentum's going to wear off a little bit because of the bye week. But, you know, it, this is also now you have two weeks to get some of these guys a little more healthy with bumps and bruises because we all know once Wisconsin and Ohio State comes around, there are going to be more bumps and bruises because they are playing the two most physical teams in the Big Ten at this point. Right, and I, and that's the biggest thing. You know, they had, they had USC right where they wanted to really throughout that game despite being down. That game could have easily been 7-7 rather than 7-3. Um, and then the other drive, I know they had another drive that ended up in a field goal, could have been more points on the scoreboard. And when you're leaving points up there, obviously that leaves room for improvement um, for sure. And and I think that's a great place for Penn State to be at. They haven't played a complete game yet. Um, and they got their biggest game still ahead of them. And I think that's the biggest thing. You know, we, you come into this game, it, when we talked about it at the beginning of the season, you're thinking this is going to be a top 10 matchup. And, and it had every every inkling that it was going to until, obviously, those last few minutes happened for for Minnesota. But, again, it's a, it's a better team than the record indicates in USC. But for Penn State now, you just gotta you just have to continue to win. It doesn't matter how beautiful the win is. You could tie it up, put some roses on it, make it fifty to nothing. As long as they win, that's that's what matters the most, and that's what you're seeing around the country. It doesn't matter; just win. It could be worse. You know, I, I'm sipping out of the souvenir cup that I got at West Virginia. I'm sipping some mm-hmm. chocolate milk because it's pretty late here on the East Coast uh, in Central Pennsylvania when we're recording this, but. He, <laughs> At least Penn State is winning, not just, you know, playing good teams and losing and their coaches saying that they're just, as long as you guys are having fun, please keep showing up. Uh, tailgating is fun. It's a good time. The atmosphere is great. Just just as long as you're you're having fun. That's, that's what matters. No, for Penn State, what matters is winning. And as long as they keep doing that, then they're in good shape. But it starts, obviously, winning the bye week. And I know it's not easy to say winning the bye week, but getting out of here healthy. It's going to be a developmental week, get a couple of days off, rest up. Obviously, the game plan has begun for for Wisconsin and probably a little bit for, for Ohio State in some of the formations and, and anything new they might be putting in or the trends or making sure that you know late-game situations that Ryan Day isn't aware of. But it, it, it's one of those situations where now Penn State's just got to keep it rolling and keep the good times going or, as, as James Franklin mentioned, you know, making it turn up like like soul playing on the on the way back. Well, absolutely. Um, you know, they're going to need that momentum to ride into Wisconsin. I mean, I'm just kind of taking a glance here at the last two games Wisconsin has played: um, 42 to seven over Rutgers, uh, 50 52 to six over Purdue, and then Purdue turned around this past week and put up 49 somehow against Illinois, you know, Penn State has a trip to Purdue coming up after the Ohio State week. Uh, so, you know, every week is a different, uh, there's a different character appearing out. You know, I mean, uh, Alabama absolutely smoked Wisconsin, you know, at the beginning of the season. And then they struggled the two games before that, with Western Michigan and South Dakota. Now, Wisconsin has got better. And then Alabama goes out and loses to Vanderbilt. Like, and struggled against South Carolina. Exactly. And and that game came down to, you know, South Carolina had two shots at that onside kick and then they got it. And then, you know, um, so every week, like you said, the, the, the goal is to win with the expanded 12 team playoff. Um, I, I think that the pretty wins are not as significant, you know, the 70 to six games or you know, the, the 68, 69, the three games are not as important as win your conference games, get yourself in a position to have one loss. You know, if, if Penn State goes out and let's just say they beat Wisconsin, um, which is not by any means going to be an easy task. All right, say they lose to Ohio State. All right. All right. You got one loss. You need to go out and you need to win the rest of your games. Now, they got Minnesota still on the schedule. 
So they they have. I'm not worried about Maryland. They're awful. Uh, Purdue that should not be much of a game, uh, but. You have the opportunity now to get yourself in a position mm-hmm. for that playoff game and not have to worry about being in the top four now. So where one loss can knock you out entirely. You can get one loss. And in, in, in some cases, especially the way this year is going, you're definitely going to have a few teams in there easily with with two losses. All right. Um, you know, and, it, and it's crazy because, you know, looking at their AP top 25, and of course – these rankings are irrelevant once the playoff stuff comes out for Penn, for ESPN because ESPN runs the show. But, you know, Texas and Oregon are still undefeated. Um, Texas has got a tough game this week. Um, Miami, I would imagine, is going to lose at some point as well in the ACC and Clemson sneaking around the chicken coop there. Iowa State is still undefeated. Um, the Big 12, there's, they are benefiting the most out of all the big big dogs leaving. Um, then we got BYU six and zero, Indiana six and zero. Um, your your favorite Pitt is it six and zero, and then Army uh, and Navy are both undefeated as well. So I mean, obviously Army and Navy had to play each other, um, so they're not going to end up <laughs> undefeated. One of them isn't, um, you know. And, and Pitt and Miami could face off in the ACC championship game. Indiana's schedule is is going to get I think tougher. Um, because they have Michigan, Ohio State, and Purdue at the end of the year. Um, at the last, you know, I love I love logos that have letters in it. The last part of their last three games of their schedule say "mop" with Michigan, Ohio State, and Purdue. While Penn State's next three games spell "wow," which is kind of you know the the theme of this year for college football. Well, you brought up Pitt, the uh, you know Pitt. We all know my, my feelings about that program and that coach. Um, so this week they have Syracuse. Uh, and, and Kyle McCord, Kyle McCord can swing it. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's what's, what's interesting is, um, uh, of all people, Ryan, this, this past weekend, he, he texted me and he says, you know, the serious question here, Kyle McCord seems like he's a lot better than he got since he got away from Ohio State and how they were using him and stuff. And, and, and is, is he a better quarterback? I don't know, because the schedule, nobody's going to confuse the Syracuse schedule with, with an Ohio State schedule. Uh, but I think it goes deeper than that. It's not just the, the stats. It's just like the whole, the whole outlier. You know, just like you can't look at a big game at the game itself. you got to look at everything around it. But well, Pitt plays Syracuse, and then they have, at this point, number 21 SMU. They got Virginia, who's lousy. They have Louisville, who could be a problem. Uh, they have Clemson, who you never know from week to week which Clemson team is going to show up. Uh, and then they have Boston College. So I'm looking at this like, let's go to November 30th. It's a couple of days after Thanksgiving. Penn State's going to end up, let's say, 11-1. Pitt sitting there at 10-1. and And enter Bob O'Brien or Bill O'Brien into the picture. What poetic justice would it be <laughs> Bill O'Brien to beat Pitt to basically knock them out of a chance of being in the top 12. Now, granted, they could still be up in, like you said, the ACC uh, uh, a championship against uh, Miami. So my money's on Bill O'Brien. Uh, it's it's This season has been a season of uncertainty. Uh, definitely uncertainty. You, you're starting to see some of these things. You're starting to think, you know, and, and along with that, Jared, you, you've got a lot of coaching movement. You know, you got, you know, DeBar going to uh, Alabama, and then you got Judd Fish leaving Arizona when he built that program up and going to Washington. Washington lost a lot of guys. UCLA, I mean, UCLA lost their coaching staff, um, and, and they're absolutely not very good. Uh, look at Arizona now. Arizona is, mm-hmm. you know, they're. They're not very good right now. Uh, Look at Washington. Then, exactly. I mean, Washington is not doing very well since Jed Fish went up there. But, you know, I uh, being here in Arizona, obviously we, we all know what, you know, Arizona State is sitting here at 5-1. and one. Um, Obviously I have some friends out there. You know who you are. I know you listen to this podcast because you asked me to send it to you. Uh, so I, I'm going to go out here with an Arizona State shout-out. 
going away from the Penn State team. For, and, and they got a running back here, Cam Scadaboo, who's mm-hmm. about five five foot nine, and it looks like he weighs about 225, 230. And he's like an absolute wrecking ball. Like, he wears no knee pads. He looks like he's wearing shorts. He has low cut black socks on. Uh, just a throwback to old time three yards in a cloud of dust. Well, last week at the end, you talk about finishing games. And he had two long touchdown runs there at the end of the game in the fourth quarter to, to seal that win. Uh, so ASU, of course, I'm following some of their stuff, you know, and they're complaining about not being in the top 25. Well, they're not in the top 25 because you really haven't played anybody. Yes, they played Utah. Cam Rising is 37 years old right now, going for his 19th year of eligibility coming up. Because he got hurt, he's never been the same since Penn State knocked him out of the Rose Bowl. Um, but let's see. They 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 go on the road this week to Cincinnati, and they still have Oklahoma State. So you know ASU has a little bit of a horse in the game right now. Um, they're five and one. They control the destiny. Will they make the top twelve with an eleven and one record? They could. Do I expect them to? I don't. Uh, but I love it. Like, like you said, there's a lot of uncertainty this year, and, and it, it's chaos. I know you text me, you know, late at night. Sometimes I'm thinking, for crying out loud, it's almost 10 o'clock at night here. It's 1 in the morning back home, and Jared's still texting me saying, got to love all the chaos in college football. That's right. That's absolutely right. Uh, and it is. And, and you know, it's mentioned you, 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 funny you mentioned him because he's the only player – that has broken more tackles than Ashton Jinty at, Penn, at Boise State, which is Your absurd. Boys. I mean, he's putting up some big numbers. Uh, um, and Boise State is a player, I think, for that group of five um, option as well. And, you know, it for Penn State, though, you know, you mentioned Tyler Warren. Tyler Warren is, I, I, would, I would hope at this point, that he is on the board. Um, get, get, he would get a, an invite to, to the Heisman ceremony. I think he would be well-deserving. But we're witnessing some of the best tight end play that Penn State has seen. Um, and riding that momentum, he's their, he's their steady Eddie, right? He's the one that controls the chaos and then creates it himself. And he's been a lot of fun to watch. And that's saying something, given the amount of tight ends that they've had at Penn State that have been good. You know, Brenton Strange, Theo Johnson. Uh, to name two, Fryer move, uh, Mike Gesicki, Jesse James, yeah. even Kyle, you know, Kyle Carter, um, to, yeah. to go back a long time, you know, it, it, to be named in those sentences and those phrases with those guys, and then to be the most complete one out of those says a lot about Tyler Warren and the fact that he's willing to do it, I think is great too. And you know, riding that momentum again with Warren in that offense getting playmakers into space into positions where they're being successful is something that we haven't seen from this Penn state offense in, in a long time. Yep. Absolutely. And, and that's what's, that's what they need to get over that hump, to get over, you know, the, the Ohio States of the world, because when you look at the big 10 standings, it, it's, and you look at the kind of a, as a, as a whole, right. You know, Indiana's at the top. They got, like I said, their schedule gets infinitely diff- more difficult. Though Kurt Signetti is, is a great coach. I like what he's doing out there. Um, they've given up 89 points this year. Um, Oregon has given up 116. Penn State's given up 87. Illinois is right there as well, uh, giving up 120, but they've only scored 186. Um, and then Ohio State has scored uh, the second most points in the league and giving up only 66 points all season. But you look at kind of, again, it, it's looking at things as a whole rather than just isolated. They, their non-conference schedule was Akron who they gave up six points to Western Michigan um, who they shut out and Marshall. Obviously Penn state had Bowling Green, Kent state and obviously West Virginia um, so a little bit of a strength of schedule there difference. But again, you know, any given Saturday right now, all it takes is a win. But for Penn State and, and Ohio State both, they're both on buys. Penn State goes to Camp Randall for a primetime game. 
And then they host Ohio State, which this is the year to host them, in my opinion. Um, but the game time is going to be a factor here as well. Yeah, let's go to I, I'm I'm guessing that it could end up being the big noon big noon game. Uh, which, which is, is a crime. Which is sad. Me. Yeah, exactly. Um, That's a premier because, matchup because you may have three and four. You may have number three right. versus it, number It could four. be three and four. It could be two and three. It could be sure. two and four. There's so many moving pieces, but this game should be a primetime game. It should be a 3.30 or primetime game um, on one of the networks. Um, my hope w- is that it is a primetime game. There is nothing quite like a whiteout atmosphere at, at Beaver Stadium. Obviously, this isn't the whiteout. Whiteout no. energy. Whiteout that energy. Would give, that would give Penn State three primetime games in a row, which I'm not sure that they are willing to do. But a 3.30 game wouldn't be bad either. Put, put a 3.30 game in there. It's still going to be a great atmosphere. Probably a little bit under the lights since it's November uh, at Beaver Stadium. But again, for this game to be played at noon, it just zaps some of the energy and the excitement out. And that's what makes big games like that special is going into it and being like, okay, like this is building. The tension is building. The, the, the emotions are building throughout the morning. And it might be some of the liquid encouragement that people are drinking, some of the, <laughs> the food or whatever, but it just adds to it. It makes it that much more of a special atmosphere whenever games are like that. So. Sure. I agree. Absolutely. But we're, again, continuing to build momentum and capitalizing it. We're going to talk a little bit more about college football as a whole and your curtain call when we come back for the third and final segment of the Behind the Curtain podcast on the Nittany Sports Now Network. Welcome back to the third and final segment of Behind the Curtain podcast on the Nittany Sports Now Network. I'm Jared Murph. Biggest thing, you know, biggest takeaway I have for Penn State right now going into the bye week is confidence. The confidence of Drew Aller. To be able to throw interceptions and recover and and play your best football when it matters the most, which is exactly what he did against USC. Those That level of confidence in yourself, in your team, you know, it it, it goes not just to Drew Aller and Tyler Warren and Nicholas Singleton and, and Katron Allen having that confidence, but it's Andy Kotelnicki having the confidence that his players can get the job done. It's Jawan Sider having the confidence in his backs that they are the best on the field on any given day. It's Tyre Howe producing once again one of the best tight end rooms in the country and having the confidence that they're going to be able to do their job. James Franklin to have that confidence uh, in his players and his coaches doing that job. And that's something that was missing throughout many years under James Franklin. Absolutely. You, you've watched the development of Drew Allah, and, and, and not only are we seeing it, again, pointing to the national media, um, there has been the discussion about him, uh, the difference in him this year versus last year. And this, this goes back to Mike Yurkus. And when you start looking at what he had at his disposal, and you know, he was an absolute dreadful, dreadful uh, coach for, for, for Drew Aller to be there, even though he's the reason Drew Allah went there, um, if, if you recall. But you look at Allah, and, and, and the, it comes back to me, it comes back to that, the one play that they were trying to get the snap off, and and Allah just went berserk. You know, like he was clapping his hands, jumping up and down, and then yelling. And then when they went back into the field, you know, Allah was like pointing out in the field, and he was being very – very pointed, very direct, like with his guys, and he was yelling, like not at him, but like, and that's something we didn't see last year. And, and mm-hmm. you can see that confidence building and building. I mean, you look at his stats from last year: twenty-five touchdowns, two interceptions, a rating of one thirty-six point nine. You go into this year, his completion percentage is up by over ten percent, almost eleven. And even though he does have the four interceptions. His QB rating this year is up 40 points from last year. Uh, and, and, and the confidence, like you said, you know, the confidence starts. We all know. We all know where the confidence starts. And, and your leaders are your, your quarterback. And, and, and once that starts happening, people start buying into it. People start believing in themselves more. Like, you know, and, and it's it's huge. And confidence is, you know, Judd, you played the game, you coached the game, you watched the games. Confidence is, is a thing that, 
you either have or you don't. And if once you get it and others start feeding off of that, you start to believe in yourself more. And I, and I think that's one of the things, as you said, that Penn State's been lacking in, in recent years and, and we're seeing the difference. Now, where that would come true is that they can come in here and beat Wisconsin, beat Ohio State, and in the manner that we have seen with them with USC, stay the course, test your metal, come out on top. I'm going to tell you that confidence would have a lot to do with that and in, in, in making those games be a different result than they have in the past. 100%. And, you, you know, last year they, were, they weren't playing. They were just out there running the offense. And what I mean by that is they were thinking too much. Drew Aller – was very methodical. He didn't challenge himself a lot on on, on many of those passes, uh, which is why you saw the the touchdown to incompletion ratio. That's not to say that he didn't have a great year because I thought he did, but he didn't test himself because he, that, that confidence, that swagger wasn't there. They weren't allowed to really have that last year. But this year, Kono Nicky has brought a, a, a wave of change to this offense. Even the personalities, and I know I mentioned this before, you know, even the personalities on at media day and at practice are so totally different than what they had been under your stitch. And, and kudos for James Franklin to make that decision and make that change. And then to go out and get Andy Kotelnicki from Kansas, who is struggling hard right now. Um, and the Jayhawks are rock chopped yuck um, <laughs> down there um, in Lawrence. But, but again, confidence is huge. They have that confidence because – you know, this was a, a game against USC that was a toss-up. Many people thought that this could be one of Penn State's two losses this year. Um, mm-hmm. I believe I took them at 11-1 and one with their loss being Ohio State. 11-1 and one gets you a, a first-round game in a playoff this year, um, and that's exactly what Penn State needs. I would love that personally and financially because that's um, Christmas time where Penn State has a home game playing at Beaver Stadium. Um, that's a much cheaper trip than going pretty much anywhere else uh, in the country at that time of year. For, but, for you, it is. Well, yes. Not for you. <laughs> you're out in Arizona unless they come out and play somewhere somewhere out there. But, again, 11-1 and one is attainable. Um, obviously, there can be slip-ups any, any, any given day. But for right now, Penn State is still 6-0. and oh. They are one of the few bowl-eligible teams at the moment uh, based on where their um, buys have been. But the biggest thing, the biggest games are still ahead of them, and it's continuing to to keep that momentum for the good. And if you do have a setback, recovering from it, bouncing back, and figuring it out the next play. Yeah, I, I think that's the difference here. I think that the you know the the confidence, the momentum, uh, everything is trending in the right direction. And that doesn't mean that Penn State's just going to go through and walk through the rest of their schedule but they have a couple more elements at their disposal this year internally that, hey guys, we can we can get this done. That's, don't, don't freak out, don't stress out. All right, last ride was bad, just like you said. Let's get ready for the next play. We, we didn't have that. They didn't have that in the last the last few years. So it could be, um, you know, and, and, and Jared, the one thing we're, we're missing here that we haven't even touched on um, that's kind of obvious is that those things there result in wins against bigger teams, better teams, which also gets you more better position for recruiting. Um, mm-hmm. And I have a side and, and, and all that stuff. We won't touch on that. But, you know, they, they, that that can help in the recruiting. I know that they're recruiting, they're actually recruiting a linebacker here from, from right here in Peoria, like five miles down the road from me. Um, I, I believe they've offered this linebacker from Liberty High School here in Peoria. Uh, mm-hmm. I know that Franklin went and visited the, the the recruits that they're um, trying to get out of California, you know, so so that was huge. Walk into USC's backyard, mm-hmm. win that game, uh, and so so yeah. Overall, um, you know, I think everything's going in the right direction. And, and got this bye week coming up; would be good good for them to rest up a little bit, and then back out at the following week, back to business. Speaking of confidence, let's go over some of the bigger games this week before we go, and before I give you your curtain call. All right. Oregon, Purdue, 8 o'clock on Friday. This game on paper seems like it should be a blowout because Purdue is 1-5. and five. But I feel like it's going to be a little bit tougher than people think for Oregon on a Friday night at 8 o'clock. Um, 
You know, I just read something yesterday. It's funny you mentioned that, and it was about the Purdue program. Uh, Purdue always has this ridiculous way of rolling into a team that they have no business being with and either beating them or really pushing them to the limit. And it could be this game. It could be the Purdue-Oregon game. Or it could be the Purdue-Penn State game. You know, what looked Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the season like, ah, you know, it's freaking Purdue. They're awful. And then they scored 49 last week against Illinois. So, right. you, you know, you know when Oregon comes into town. Now, they gave up 50 to Illinois. You know Oregon's coming in. Oregon's probably putting up 60 in this game. Uh, you, you can see it. But that's why they play the game. What about yeah. uh, Indiana and Nebraska? I mean, uh, I want to see what Indiana's about. Like, I and, and I do, too. Same thing with Nebraska. You know, this is another challenge for them. Um, obviously their one loss is to Illinois. Um, but they've, they bounced back from that pretty well. They beat Purdue by 18. They beat a tough Rutgers team. Rutgers is like that, that piece of grit. Every time you beat, you, you want to eat your cheeseburger. It just, it just doesn't go away. Um, and that's honestly probably a microcosm of just the state of New Jersey. Um, but you add in a couple different smells, um, but yeah, that that game intrigues me. I think Indiana pulls away because it is a home game. Not that Bloomington is a tough place to play, but I do think that that helps. And that university is completely bought in on this football team. Um, the Missouri and Auburn, I think that's a it's pretty easily going to be Missouri. Um, Army's got to go or host East Carolina. Um, the tough, Alabama uh, Tennessee. Me, Alabama Tennessee is a tough one. Illinois, Michigan. Um, if Michigan loses, that's going to be the, um, one of the funniest stories of the year. Not that they lose to Illinois, but that's their third. That would be their third loss, and would eliminate them from pretty much anything premier postseason wise. So, so now that couldn't have go into a better place. Now you're going to jump to the game of the week. Oh, it's Georgia and Texas. Yeah. Now, right. now, before we talk about that, there's a trap game here in LSU and Arkansas. LSU's riding high off of beating Ole Miss. Arkansas has been known to pull, pull one out of their ass every once in a while. Sure. Um, and I think they might, especially since it's in Fayetteville, it could very easily be, be one of those things. But obviously, game of the week is Kansas State and Western – oh, wait, sorry. Um <laughs> a little throwback to, my, to Neil Brown. I hope, hopefully, everybody has fun down there. Uh, game of the week is uh, DKR Texas Memorial Stadium, Georgia number five versus Texas number one. Texas thirty-one, Georgia twenty-three. It's about the same amount of traffic violations as they've had this year. <laughs> I do think Texas wins, um, and I'm, I, I would be very interested to see where Georgia falls um, with a loss. That puts them at 5-2, and 3-2 two, and two in their conference. Um, they have that loss to Alabama, which looks worse and worse by the week. Um, but, again, you know, there's – that's what makes college football so crazy. Um, and then if Georgia beats Texas, it could be wild. You know, Texas then becomes a one-loss team, and the SEC hierarchy goes up in smoke. So, so where does Texas drop? Like, so you got undefeated, most likely Oregon, undefeated Penn State, but now you got Georgia sitting at six and one, who just beat number one Texas. So you put Georgia ahead of Penn State, keep Penn State at three, but then I'm afraid that Texas drops the three and Penn State drops the four. Yeah, even with a loss. Yeah. I, yeah, I have no idea. You know how the bye weeks work sometimes. You're off and then right. you get penalized. Uh, but, yeah. Right, but the good news is for Penn State, they're undefeated. And it's tough to have a, an undefeated team behind a one-loss team, despite however good or, or great that loss might look um, or be, if there is ever such thing as a great, a, a great loss. But, you know, such is life. And that's, again – what makes this year so great? Like this is to me peak college football because of how crazy it is. 
every every week brings you something new. We could see a multitude of different upsets. That's just the top 25. Um, who knows what's going to happen throughout the country. But it's a great time to, to be a college football fan. Absolutely. So it is. Right. And it's a great time, obviously, for your curtain call. So my curtain call today is, once again, on, on officiating. Um, of course, you know, if you're perusing the X feeds after the USC game last week, what do we see is a bunch of USC clamoring about the officials and the, the calls that they didn't get, and yada, yada, yada. Um, Obviously, we know my feelings on, on the pass interference that they caught on Penn State on the first possession. Uh, so fast forward a little bit to overtime, and the, the, the USC receiver did a wheel out, and Zion Tracy was doing his best Joey Porter imitation by just <laughs> grabbing his jersey the entire way down the field. I'm looking at it like, okay, he's going to get nailed, and nothing. The next play, it looked like the Penn State defender. I can't remember if it was Kimball that got there or if it was, um, uh, oh, my goodness. I don't remember which one it was. I don't remember the, the defensive back. But he kind of came in behind the guy, looked like he had his own Miranda, no call again. And then the throw was low, the throw was bad. And, and, and the USC people are all going nuts, okay? But, again, no mention about – the bogus pass interference call. But if you go back and look at Julian Fleming, uh, and, and, and we haven't talked about this, but I'm going to stay with the officiating on this. On that fourth and 10 play, the USC defender had Fleming's jersey the entire way mm -hmm. down. And when, and when he made his cut on his end, he still had his jersey and Fleming still made the catch. So uh, kudos to Fleming because he entered into the Isaac Smoko range of wow, big time catches right there when you needed the most. But with the officiating, so what I noticed with this game, as you know, there was like no holding calls going either way between the USC guys, Penn State. This is one of the few times that I have watched officials let them play the game. And when I mm -hmm. say that, aside from the pass interference in the first quarter, it looked like we're going to let these kids play and we're going to make it both ways. And, and I think they actually did that. And I think they did that. So my curtain call is, doesn't really come too much for me. But I did kind of give them a little bit of a, a berate on my top 10 things, I think. I think after going back and watching the game in, in its entirety again to, and, and paying attention to that, uh, hats off to the officials for this, for actually not inserting themselves into the game and becoming the game. They let the kids decide the game. So I, I compliment them for that. No, it's, I think that's a really good way to look at it, and I think that's a perfect way to wrap it up. You saying something positive about the officials is always a good thing and a good way to wrap it up. For Murph, this has been Jared Prugar on the Behind the Curtain podcast. We thank you, as always, for listening, and we'll catch you again next week.